Hello, we are going to talk about what coercion is now and how to avoid it and then talk about some things that we can do instead of using coercion. My name is Kelly Bryson. I'm a behavior analyst here at the Babcock Center. And I'm Olivia Sitton. I'm a registered uh, behavior technician here at the Babcock Center. Um, first thing to talk about is what coercion is. Coercion is using pressure on someone to get them to do what you want and discounting their feelings and rights. And most people using coercion will create counter coercion. Counter coercion is when someone responds to coercion <clears throat> by avoiding, escaping, and fighting back. So um, that could also be if a client is using counter coercion in response to coercion when they say, I know my rights. Or a client is using counter coercion when they are told to do something and then they curse, yell, or become aggressive. Um, a client is also using counter coercion when they refuse to do something, like they're refusing to get off the van, refusing to go into the workshop, or to take their medication. So basically, when we try to force somebody to do something, then they're likely to tell us no, they might do things like curse at us, they might try to avoid us and get away from us, um, and they could also um, just try to escape by you know, running away or avoiding the whole situation entirely. Um, at times people may be using counter coercion because of a history that they have of being coerced. So if somebody has been told what to do over and over and over again, they may not wait for you to use coercion on them. On them. They may assume that you're going to use coercion and start fighting back immediately or start avoiding you immediately um, when, uh, when you start to ask them to do something. Um, so that's something that we can look at. It, if there's counter coercion, it doesn't always mean that there is coercion going on. It may be something that's happened in the past, but often if we're seeing counter coercion, it's because um, somebody's trying to force somebody to do something. So now we're going to go over to our set of questions. Number one, which of the following are rights people with disabilities do not have? A, to drink six Cokes a day. B, to smoke or do snuff. C, to use the bathroom five times an hour when they need assistance. Or is it D, to walk into a busy road? The answer is going to be D, to walk into a busy road. And we're going to go over the, the other options um, that it could be. So the first one, to drink six Cokes a day, um, that may be something that may not be a great idea for somebody, but there have been days in my life where I have had six Cokes, um, and they have that right as well. Um, we can restrict that if there is a medical order saying that they are not allowed to, uh, to have that. Occasionally that will happen. Most of the time when people are restric restricting somebody's uh, number of beverages or you know, sodas they can have, it's because that person is, um, you know, feels that they know better than that person what they should do. But it is that person's right to choose their beverages. Option B is going to kind of bounce a little bit off of what Kelly said. When it comes to the tobacco or anything of that nature, um, we cannot put any type of restrictions on it. Same thing with the Cokes. If they want to smoke or do the snuff multiple times a day, then that is completely up to them and that's their choice. Um, the only time when it comes that we can have any type of restriction on that is if it's written by a doctor and it's more so of a life or death type of situation um, but that's very rare that that does happen it might be a time like if somebody were on oxygen right um, yeah. and then we would say you can't smoke but we could offer them a different type of tobacco product if they still choose to um, you know consume some type of tobacco same thing with cokes it's not a good idea um, for somebody who has diabetes to be drinking cokes because of all the sugar um, can really affect their blood sugar a lot um, but without a doctor's order saying that they can't have it um, we're going to try to do things like offer them diet coke instead and you know try to help prevent that situation but if they absolutely you know make that choice to have a coke um, then we 
do not have the right to stop them from doing that without a doctor's order. Um, the third one is, um, do they have the right to use the bathroom five times an hour when they need staff assistance? Um, and this can be very difficult because, you know, we understand that generally you're not responsible for just one person. There's multiple people that you're supporting and it can be very difficult to balance, um, uh, you know, supporting four, five, six other people with uh, somebody who needs to use the restroom frequently. What we would want you to do in that situation is please make sure that you're documenting that because there can be um, some medical issues that can make somebody more, you know, need to go to the bathroom more frequently and we want to make sure that um, medical is aware of it and that they have a chance to provide any care that somebody needs. Um, we also need you to recognize that People can go to the bathroom when they want to, even if it is multiple times in an hour and can be very inconvenient. Um, I would call a supervisor and ask for support in those situations. Please let behavior know that that's happening um, by putting it in a T-log and marking it high. Um, but that person does have the right to go to the bathroom five times in an hour, even if it requires assistance. And uh, the last D, to walk into a busy road. Um, as we said, this is the answer for this question, which of the following are rights people with disabilities do not have? Um, this one, pretty self-explanatory. We don't want to, we don't want our consumers to get hurt. Um, walking into a busy road is absolutely a way that they can get hurt. So it's gonna be important for us to redirect them and get them to a safer environment um, if we can. And have um, someone help you as well if you feel that the environment or the situation is getting a little out of hand. Also remember to use least restrictive to restrictive when you're dealing with that situation depending on maybe how escalated that individual is. Um, and also keep in mind of the therapeutic options training that you've had. Feel free to reach out to behavior as well if you do feel like you need a little bit more training in therapeutic options and we can have someone come out and assist with that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so okay. before we move on to the next topic, I'll have a quick question for you, Kelly. Okay. Um, what would you do in the situation where there was a consumer and they recently had made some suicidal statements? but now they're wanting to use a um, knife to cut up tomatoes in the kitchen. What would you do in that situation if you were a staff member? Well, I hope that um, everybody would follow procedures on that and that they would notify their supervisor and notify uh, clinical immediately when somebody makes a statement um, about harming themselves. Um, even if you don't feel that statement is, um, you know, indicating that they really are going to harm themselves um, because that's not something uh, that I can make a determination on or Olivia can make a determination on. That has to go to a psychiatrist or someone else um, who's a doctor uh, to determine how to, how to move forward with that. So we always put somebody on one-on-one um, -on -one supervision within arm's length um, when somebody makes a statement like that. And then that may be relaxed depending on um, you know, other, situa or other circumstances that are going on. Um, or it may stay that way if, if uh, we feel that that's what's necessary for someone to be kept safe. Um, during that initial period of time when you, you know, you're contacting people, please remove anything that might be dangerous from the area. Um, don't let somebody use a knife at that time. And then you're gonna follow what your supervisor says at that point. Um, now we are going to talk about different types of coercion. <clears throat> and the first one that I, I would like to touch on is criticism. Um, just to give you a couple examples, um, there's an example would be um, saying to a consumer, you just don't seem to learn or you just make bad decisions, don't you? Or you're in a bad mood, aren't you? Um, another big example would be during PDR, um, talking about the consumer in a negative way while the consumer is also in the room. Um, this is really important that we're aware um, of what the things that we say when we are in PDR because the, the consumer is listening. 
um, they are taking in all of the information, the negative things that are being said, and it can cause a problem behavior. Maybe not right there at that moment, um, but it could happen later in the day or right after they leave out of the PDR room. So we want to make sure that we don't use criticism in front of the client um, while we're in PDR or in any circumstance at all. One, one thing that happens often is the next time it's that's that person is scheduled to come into PDR, they may refuse to come because they were criticized the last time they were there. And sometimes there are things that you need to let people know. So um, there are uh, behavior data sheets that are always out um, on the table outside the PDR room. And that's a really great way for staff to let um, the team know any concerns that they have without saying it in front of the client in a way that would make them not want to come back to PDR, right? Um, the next type of coercion uh, that is sometimes used is to use sarcasm. So when people say things like, look who's in charge, I guess you got your medical license and we're going to be working for you, um, those, those statements uh, are, just, are trying to make somebody feel bad. Sometimes we can use sarcasm in a humorous way and the other person is in on the joke and you can laugh together about it. But if those, if you're making statements that are making the person feel bad um, and you're trying to get them to change what they're, you know, what they're doing by making those statements, then that is a type of coercion and we should avoid it. Absolutely. Um, the next type that we're going to talk about is threats. Um, some examples of that is, if you don't sit down, um, I'm going to have your, I'm going to call your house manager. Or if you don't eat your lunch, I'm going to call the coordinator. Um, another example would be, if you don't take your meds, you're not going to get your Coke. Um, these are all very unacceptable when it comes to speaking to our consumers. Um, we need to make sure that we're aware of how we're asking them to do things. Um, your tone of voice is going to be something that's important here. Um, and the way that you ask something, um, making sure that we're not um, trying to bully them in any type of way to get some, to get a response that we would like for from them. So um, it's important to make sure that we offer choices um, and talk to the consumer about what it is that they want. Why exactly? Um, why don't they want to eat lunch right now? Maybe their stomach's hurting, maybe they're not feeling well. So just learning a little bit more about what they're going through or if there's an illness going on, it's going to be important um, instead of making those threats. Um, and it is okay to notify a house manager or to notify a coordinator if there is a problem um, because sometimes they need to know what's going on but don't use that uh, as a threat to try and change the person that you're supporting um, and make them do what you want. Um, the next example is logic. Um, so that's trying to explain to somebody, um, you know, all the reasons that they shouldn't be making the decision that they're making. Um, the problem with you, with using logic is not that we shouldn't try and explain things, it's that it's it's about timing, really. Um, so when somebody has already decided that they want a Coke, and then you're saying things like, you know you shouldn't drink so many Diet Cokes, they run right through you, that's very unlikely to change their behavior, and it is very likely um, that they're going to avoid you, they're going to um, try and get away from that situation, and that they may try to use force um, because it is a type of coercion, and so you're likely to see counter coercion where they're trying to make sure that they get what they want um, and push back in that way. Um, yeah. um, so the next is going to be arguing. Um, this is going to be any type of negative back and forth conversation between you and the consumer, um, an example would be, you have to go to the workshop and that's it. Um, no, you listen to me, those types of things. The back and forth is just going to cause uh, problem behavior if it's not already started. Um, it may also introduce new problem behaviors. Um, so 